The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Kev, okay, I want to play you some sounds. How about, let me just, oh, there we go. Let me play this to you. What do you think this is? It's a cam that's on a. It's a camera that's on a. Uh, on a. On a I think it's a police cam actually. One of those. Uh, one of those ones that they wear on their chest. Hmm. You know, years ago we used to we used to break up raves, illegal raves. Did now you? We break up weddings. Oh, oh! I thought you were on about the royal we there. No, 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 no. I no. never went to a rave ever. No. Well, I have been to a few raves, but no. The point. The point really was. Uh, you know, years ago <laughs> we'd break up raves, and now now look at us in this in this bold new era. We're breaking up people's nuptials. Is that what it was? Yeah, wedding. Um, Hundred guests congregated in breach of coronavirus, which is yeah, which is correct. That should be broken up because they shouldn't be doing that. There's a band called the Wedding Smashers. Is there? Yeah. <laughs> well, now there's an official police arm. The Wedding Smashers. <laughs> the Wedding Smashers. I tell you what, when I saw that thing of Liverpool. By the way, ten thousand quid is what the w- wedding wedding sh- organizer got. They should find them got every fine. single person there. Ten thousand pounds. Ten k every one. Yes, really? all of them. Yeah. Kev, you are the strong arm of the law. Well, did you see the Liverpool thing? Like one minute before oh, lockdown. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. And I don't care who listens to me. I was absolutely furious. Mm. Furious. So that was the mayor, actually, in Liverpool. Absolutely. Quite right. So many businesses are being affected and health and people dying. And then you have these idiots. And there's no other word for Well, there is other words for them. <laughs> careful, I'm not allowed Kev. to use careful, them. Careful, Kev. I, I was incensed, absolutely incensed. If, they, if you know any of those people, don't ever speak to me. Don't ever tell me, <laughs> because I would be so angry. Oh, My Kev. heart is beating furiously oh, with anger oh. and aggression. On a light, anyway, good on, morning. On a How light, are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. On a lighter note, Kev, I want to play you this, though. And our guest today is Ziza. Ziza! You can tell us all about Ziza in a, in a short while. But I cut the, the last bit of the interview, I'm afraid, I cut off. Because I just wanted to end with her talking about, you know, where you can um, see her work, etc. Then there was a little gem right at the end. And she's a she's a bit of a Kev fan. You're my favourite <laughs> wedding photographer. You should uh, go to my wedding. Oh, uh, well, I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you get married, when you get married, I'll be there. You didn't know what to say to her, did you? I didn't know. You're my favourite wedding photographer. I know. Well, <laughs> I, 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 well I, since, yeah. Well, you have to listen to the whole interview, but yes, um, she's amazing, absolutely amazing. I do believe Kev's just got red. The Fuji cast. Look at that! I got a booking. I got a booking. <laughs> you got a booking. Your size is booking. That's good. Welcome to the Fuji cast. You and your questions from our electronic mailbag, and of course, also through the uh, the private Fuji cast Facebook group, which has been growing nicely of late. You're welcome to become a part of that. If you'd like to send a mail through, you can still do it the old way. Click at fujicast.co.uk. If you're not a Fuji film shooter, it makes no odds. You're still warmly welcome here because the talk is also aimed at just being this thing called a photographer. Um, thank you to our friends as well who have now supported us on Patreon. I think Kev's going to come back with some names very, very soon. Yeah, thank um, you so much, guys. Kev's, Kev's Book of the Week. What, what, one are, what one are we doing this week? Kev's Book of the Week Kev's Book is... Of the week. Kev's it's Book called, of the Week! It's a very new book. It was only yeah. published last week. It's called In the Limelight, The Visual Ecstasy of New York City Nightlife in the 1990s. It's the Limelight Club in New York. Yes. Not the one that was in London. No, uh, that's why it's called New York City Nightlife. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah otherwise it would call it London. London, yeah. 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 <laughs> I got that. Um, And of course, um, after today's show, some of the subjects get picked up in the Facebook, in the private Facebook group, and you can all discuss them. So there we go. Pack show coming up. Um, And of course, Ziza. Pack show? No, pack show. Pack show. I I prefer cabbage. I much prefer cabbage, sorry. (laughs) Oh, Kev. And Ziza is coming up as well. Tell us a bit about Ziza, by the way. Oh, Ziza as well. So I don't want to ruin the interview, but Ziza, I met her a couple of times. I think the last time was actually in New York. And, uh, was it at the limelight? <laughs> Not the one in London. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I think there might have been a couple of gin and tonics later, but it wasn't there. And uh, sh- she's she's just an insanely talented photographer who's yeah. got an amazing backstory. Yes, and and as you'll hear, um, is is a very revered. Um, photographer for all the right reasons so I don't, I don't want to kind of ruin it too much but she, she's a food film ambassador but yes. that's that's kind of like the the least relevant thing of her accolades yeah. I would say I, I noticed that she didn't really talk too much about that you talked really about I love the story of her mum and her family and, and, and I don't want to be a, yes I don't want to spoil no don't ruin so. it shh, shh. Yes. no spoilers right questions you, you go first uh, I'll go first okay this is from uh, Nick Norris I love that name I always imagine him with a nunchucker in his hand <laughs> Nick Morris. Nick Norris. Oh, Nick Norris. Nick Norris. Oh, yeah, the Kung Fu uh, martial yeah. Well, arts. Well, it's Chuck Norris, Norris, isn't it? It's 
Chuck Norris. Yeah, yeah I was gonna. But, I was about to say that's not Chuck Nick, Norris. Is yeah, it? but Nick Norris sounds like it's a Nick martial son. art. <laughs> it sounds like a martial art name, doesn't it? Right. Nick Norris. Nick Norris. Nick Norris. Uh, much better than Kevin Mullins. <laughs> anyway, getting into some film set photography. Lens lineup is the question, and I'm yeah. shooting with an X Pro Three and an XT Twenty. Uh, am I solid with the 56 1.2 or do I need a more telephoto lens I'm assuming the wide shots are harder to do without getting in the way so film set photography uh, ah, right, which okay. neither of us have done well no I have I did oh. a bit of television um, set photography oh, with and that was in the days of film I, I, I you would have been using blimp uh, no blimp. no we didn't that was a thing you um, might use a blimp no didn't use a blimp I know they exist but no um, where I, I had a, a a course at the BBC. We in the days when the BBC was flush with money, um, they would send producers and presenters off for you could you could apply to go on courses. And I wanted to go and learn be a television cameraman. Mm. That's what I really wanted. Mm. But the course was oversubscribed. That's what Damien Lovegrove was. He was uh, a was cameraman he? on Only Fools and Horses. No oh way. no, Lighting. I think he was involved lighting in Lighting and Only Lighten. Fools. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I might have bumped into him. Then. He's got a lot better because the lighting on Only Fools and Horses was atrocious. <laughs> Lots of shadows everywhere. Was that his lighting? You could even see. You can sometimes see the camera, the shadow of the cameraman really? in the in the, film, in the movie set. Get that love grove out! He's <laughs> ruining the shot. I'm sure that wasn't Damien. No, no, he'd no, have no, done no, it absolutely. No, no, no. He perfectly. would have been on the later episodes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He'd definitely. Have, he'd have nailed it with Damien. Um, yeah, and so yeah, I, I learned to do some set photography instead with a proper grumpy photographer at the BBC who said to me a couple of things. He said, uh, "Listen." If I um, if I if I hear a click or or if anybody if any of the crew turn around because you've clicked, you're out of here. And that was basically it. <laughs> so you had to learn to in live studio uh, audiences learn to click during the laughs. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, yeah. there you go, Nick Norris. Yeah, there's, there's a so, good tip. and it was uh, generally uh, I can't remember the, the focal length at the time. I, well, I would I mean, imagine things, it would have been something like an eighty-five, maybe a one-three-five, something like that. Things are very different now, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I, I like the fifty-six one-point-two. You might even consider the new F one fifty mil F one because that's going to give you that extra little bit of, of uh, light. You know, because you're not going to be using flash or anything. No. Uh, dependent obviously on the set um but yeah i mean i would have a another lens just in case probably for wider stuff if they do want some kind of i'm i'm not qualified to talk about this obviously but mm. in case they want some wider set wide type shots yeah makes sense to go for i don't know maybe a 10 24 16 55 maybe i remember keith bernstein i'm sure he said he was using a 24 mil or mm. something between uh, keith you're gonna correct me if i'm wrong but i'm sure I'm sure you said it was something like your 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 weapons of choice were 24 and 85 focal length. Yeah, now he's using full frame Sony, terms. isn't he? Yeah, so yeah, yeah so his terms. would be full frame. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, that seems about right. Somewhere between 24 and 85, I guess. You know, depends. Really, does depend on on what they're asking you to do. But uh, and then just stay out the way. Yeah, and always use electronic shutter unless mm. the light is really bad. Mm. In which case, use mechanical shutter, but mm. don't click. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you need to get a yeah. blimp. Yeah, but I don't think people use blimps anymore. That's not a good industry to be in anymore, is it? No, not really. What did you used to do? You used to be a blimp maker. <laughs> no, I don't, yeah. Well, that's why Keith uses the um, Sony, isn't it? The yeah. mirrorless system, so that yeah. you can be entirely silent. Well, they all are now, aren't they? Yeah. Nikon, yeah, Canon, yeah. they've all jumped into bed yeah, with the, the yeah. electronic shutters, which yeah. is good. Yep. Well, not good for blimp makers. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> right, Bradley Porritt. Uh, Neil, you've been talking about uh, not using your Instagram since the original lockdown started. Oh, you should have read this one, really. Uh, I wonder what your reasons are. I know it's a question to me, but it seems weird when I'm reading a question to me. And if you will go back to it. I'm in a similar quandary with my own one. When I do come back, which I probably will, I'm thinking about having a, a better breadth of work on there. At the moment, it's mainly my wedding and portrait work but I'm thinking of having so much more, maybe some commercial work even. Is this a good idea, though? Now, actually, it's probably... A, you are the right one to ask this because uh, my my Instagram account is just full of weddings. That's all. I thought, mm. let's make it wedding, 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 and then a bit more wedding. Mm. But um, you don't do that. You do a real breadth of work. Well, I do I, I do, and I don't, to, to clarify, <laughs> to make right. things easy. Because yeah. um, I actually have a street... Did you understand that, everyone? Uh, I do have a street photography Instagram account as well called yeah. Mullins on the Street, which yeah. I have only ever put about six pictures on. Okay. Um, and the idea for that was to, to do street photography stuff. My kids would now say, how many subscribers have you got? Uh, I think it's about 1,800 on that one. That's not bad but for about six photos. 32,000 <laughs> 32, on the other one. Ah, oh, there we go. There we go, yeah. You'd back, be a hero. Back in the box, Mullins. You'd be a hero. Um, but, 
Yeah, so other than that, though, I do just chuck anything on my main Instagram account. Mm. Um, personal work, weddings, Fujicast stuff. I know we do work. have a Fujicast Instagram we do, account, yeah, yeah, which, we, which, <laughs> which actually has got quite a lot of subscribers. Has also, it? but I we don't think I've ever visited it. We don't. Um, <laughs> we really should. In fact, that's something I'm going to write down, and yeah. we we will do something with that. A lot of people are hashtagging Fujicast, which is good. Right. Um, so thank you. Um, <laughs> although it'd be better if you went to Patreon. Uh, <laughs> There's a hint. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I know it, it always agitates you slightly, doesn't it? When when you put up a picture of a camera and it gets more uh, more more hearts than and more comments certainly than than anything you put up from what, one of your you know beautifully beautifully composed shots from from a you know a documentary job you've just done i wouldn't uh, yeah agitate is probably a bit too strong it does affect me slightly in that if I put a picture of a battered old camera up there, it gets <laughs> you know three four five yeah. thousand likes yeah but saying that. You know, part of my business is built on that stuff. It so, feeds in, so yeah. I, yeah, you yeah. know, I'm not, I'm not too, um, not too concerned about it. I, I mean, it, it's similar to the website stuff. So, what I would typically say to somebody on this Instagram issue is, if 80% of your work is weddings and 10% is commercial and 10% is, I don't know, family, then make sure that 80% of your Instagram is weddings, 10% is commercial, and 10% is landscape. Uh, sorry, uh, family. That makes sense to me. Yeah. You know. That's, Do you think you frighten people off from one genre if you start? If, if they come, so if a, if a commercial person comes to it and they're thinking, right, let's see what this uh, this guy or girl has got, and then they find lots of wedding images, they're going to be like, ooh, okay, well, I wasn't quite ready for that. Yeah, but then you can't. Is that, is that what Bradley's? But it's pointing out. Really? Think about it, right? Look, all all marketing. If you try and ignore digital marketing mm. and think about it in real world, right? So marketing is always it's the same. It's been the same since year dot. The fact we have computers now is just something, it's just a different implementation of it. So imagine a shop window, okay? You you go past Peacock's, right? Because I know that's, that's, favorite, closed that's, down that's your time. favorite shop. It's closed down now. Oh, oh, is it? Okay, so yeah. um, do, do is one. any shop still open? Which you, ones are still open? Yeah, just give me a list. Uh, <laughs> John Lewis? John Lewis? Closing. Uh, in this town. Uh, Bentles? <laughs> Gone. Beals? <laughs> that was the big one in Reading, wasn't it? I don't think it? we've ever had one. Um, Not here, anyway. And some Gone. Of- <laughs> not in this time oh no we did have an Ann Summers actually in sleepy Newbury oh, there okay. was an uproar but it has gone well, you know what they say about people who have poinsettia there was a buzz about that one I'm telling you poinsettia plants in their front windows what yes read, what it, read about mean? it um, anyway so the thing is let's let's just go to Peacocks right yeah. because Peacock so Peacocks yeah. is a shop that sells Peacocks. Um, it sells no. clothes, right? Oh, right, okay. Generally for I've never been older people, but it sells a lot of clothes. Now, they, for older people. They can't, they can't put every single thing in their shop window. Yeah. So they put the things in the shop window that they want to sell the most, which is usually the ones that are either on sale or the current trend. Yeah. And so that's that's it. That's marketing. You know, your shop window is your Instagram. You can't possibly have an equal... If you do more than one genre, you yeah. can't possibly have an equal... Uh, spread just doesn't make sense so think about it like a shop think about it you know if you're doing a special offer maybe if you even if you only do 10 percent of your work as family shoots but actually coming up to christmas you want to do more of those then change the emphasis leading up to christmas uh you know that's what a shop window would do a shop window dresser would do and doesn't you don't it doesn't upset people who come there looking for wedding pictures to find a picture of a well, camera but that's, or, that's or a, a commercial job or a piece of food that's or, your you know. business decision isn't mm. it if you if you want to if you want to um you know offer these stuff you've got to you, you've got to find the, the the median you've got to find the the fine lines and the margins mm. um you know your if you go to like I don't know, I can't think of any shops anymore because I haven't open. been to one for so long. Yeah. Uh, the co-op gone. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> still here. We got I a few s- of those. I spend a lot of time in the co-op. You do actually. Uh, uh, Which it. aisle do you spend most of your time in? The beer mm. aisle. Although I've given up beer. You have, haven't you? Yeah, for my gout. Yeah. So honestly, it, but that's what makes sense, doesn't it? You can't. Yeah. There's no way that you're going to be able to win that battle. You 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 can't suddenly think, okay, well, I don't really want to annoy wedding clients if if they see a commercial thing. The only answer to that is mm. to set up separate ones, and we all know how hard that oh, is. God, yeah. So think about it strategically. Think about it seasonally. Think about it. Um, you know, based on the 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 economics of your business. Mm. You know, do a 
do a mind map stick a p get a piece of paper write a mind map how much do you want to spend in terms of shooting time on particular aspects of your business mm. and then just make sure your marketing supports it i've just looked up by the way what having a poinsettia in, in, in your window means and it, there's nothing here that points towards what i think you're pointing it towards boob villa where that's bob villa oh. purchase the healthiest plant you can find <laughs> Get your mind out the gutter. There will be people nodding their heads. Hey, Mark my words. Really? Yes. Did you know close to us, Hungerford, um, is the... Maybe I shouldn't say this. <laughs> We're already in trouble with Liverpool peacocks and poinsettia owners. Yeah. So. <laughs> and actually, the Hungerford folk, they'll set their Morris dancers on me if I'm about to say what I'm going to say. So, no, we'll move on. Your question. Uh, okay, so, Scott, we've got one from Scott Johnson, who says he's an elephant in the room. Oh, no, there's an elephant in the room. <laughs> as much as I love the positivity from the companies and associations in providing content to inspire us during this situation, what nobody is talking about is its survival. With potentially the toughest six months any of us have had to face ever in business, yeah. I think we need to shift from how to market for the next 12 months, etc. webinars and Facebook lives to this is what we need to do to survive. What are your thoughts? Now, I think this is probably a little bit of an old um, post. I think this came well, from Well, I Facebook. think, no, he's looking forward to the next six months i think now yeah. not not forward as in that oh i'm really looking forward to this i mean I, I think he's considering we've done the first six yes which we had which, which we kind of just you know got through but now the next six is this real survival mode isn't it correct and it's not just for weddings of course it's for all business mm. all, all photography businesses but all businesses and you know i think uh, there's a reply to this thread from uh, glasgow lee who says my worry is not just if weddings will happen mm. but we'll be forced to reserve our time for next year's clients only to have to repay all the money they have paid for booking fees if they don't go ahead and then morton jensen carries on by saying along those lines out of my own curiosity is it possible and in case how difficult is it to shift from wedding photography to other genres when you're a pro um, yeah, well, I think so that's, that's, that's a whole load of well, okay, There's there. two questions there. Can we deal with the deposits thing first of all? Because we've been talking about this a bit. Mm. Deposits. Now, I know you're. Um, I don't take a large deposit for for weddings or booking fee or however you package this up, mm -hmm. according to how taxation works for you. But yeah, the booking fee, the deposit. I've always taken a lower one. Yeah, me too. And I don't mind sharing that. It's two. It was three, but it's now two hundred pounds. Mm. Mine's always been two hundred. Okay. Yeah. I I dalliance with the three for a while, but it's two now. And I like personally, I like as a business model to collect at the other end. Me too. I did that for a variety of reasons. One of those actually was um, uh, was um, anxiety. I think I'd have been anxious taking half to three quarters up front, which I know some people do, um, because what, what what if I got a broken leg or something and mm -hmm. had to start paying all this money back? That mm -hmm. would, you know, I never wanted to be in that situation, so I was happy to collect at the other end. Yeah, but equally now, people are saying that you, know, you have to give everything back because there's been a ruling that you can't now keep anything if you've not done the work. Mm. Now, actually, that wasn't a ruling. That was advisory, wasn't it, for, for one? And we're talking about a UK market now. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm, probably worth mm -hmm. pointing out as well. But um, I think in terms of that £200 of deposits, I don't think anybody can ask for that back because I think that's fair admin. Okay, so my understanding is that the CMA, which is a UK governmental thing called the Competition Markets Authority, yeah. have said, and they, they've actually you know, come up with a ruling on this recently, that a deposit... you. People can ask for a deposit back, even if it's been called a, a booking fee or a non-refundable thing. But the vendor is uh, can withhold as much as they think is reasonable for yes. work done. Yes. So you and I had this, I don't mind having this conversation yeah. publicly, we had this conversation yesterday about yeah. a, uh, a booking fee. And, um, you know... My attitude was so. Th th this client is um, cancelling and you know wants their booking fee back, mm -hmm. and all I have done to expedite that booking is answer an email where they said we'd like to we love your work. I answered an email and said here's my fees. Mm. They replied and said great. What do we do? I sent them a booking form. They filled it in in total time. If I added it up, yeah, yeah. would have been about seventy five seconds of my time. Okay, so. <laughs> there is no way <laughs> that I I can uh, I can justify saying that two hundred pounds was enough time spent, uh, you know, in terms of that. Okay, right? but that's me. That's you. That's now, me. In, my, in my case, in your case, yeah. it's very different. I, mean, I invest um, a lot of time in doing Zoom. I always, in, you know, I don't don't say Zoom. I hate that word. 
Uh, sorry. Zoom and Skype. Zoom. Skype, all right? Yes. The Zoom just brings, <laughs> th- 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 like, gives me the heebie-jeebies, the word. I, okay. Well, I will have had a digital or uh, in the past, because, of course, a lot of these bookings now relate to the past prior to this blooming pandemic, um, face-to-face meetings. Yeah. Often those face-to-face me- meetings were 90 minutes. Yeah. Usually are. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that would involve the meeting, that would involve setting up the meeting, that would involve then uh, contracts, that would involve uh, – there's there's a fair amount of two-way in administration when, when I make a booking. Mm. Maybe, maybe I should have looked at it in terms of the way you work it. It seems to – yeah, you're, you're, the- more, you're, more, you're more economic with the time that you spend with but your clients the, prior to a wedding. The point is, though, you have easily spent £200 worth of time. Now, now my clients, so. my clients, none of my clients luckily have asked for the deposit pack. None of them. In fact, every single one of the ones that cancelled said uh, – I, all, all by one of them pretty much in their email of cancellation said look we understand this is going to be tough for you so we don't expect their deposit yeah, back yeah. We're, I'm coming at this from a uh, you know from the CMA's point of view and it's mostly aimed at venues and places like that who have taken very very large deposits well, we're, we're talking I mean there was one of the news this 16 week for 16,000 you're right um, There's I've seen a few in the news for 20 and 25 That's, now, now then you have to ask yourself how much work have I really done correct and, and some of the venues are saying, well, that's fine, but equally, we took dates out of a diary which prevented somebody else from having it. Yes, but you can, according to the CMA, you cannot use that as a rule that for holding right? back okay. a deposit. All right. However, a lot of the venues, I think, what they're doing is saying, well, your deposit covered the food. And, and and the CMA is saying, but you haven't bought the food, you haven't paid for the food, you know, so you, a deposit can't cover... To counter that one, I saw one venue that said, yeah, that may be so, but we have to have a contract with a food vendor, which, we, which we've which we kept up even during this time. Yep, that's so, their so, fault. Yeah. You know, that's they, that's their responsibility to break that contract that with a their respon- vendor. A responsibility to all their clients in case weddings come back online would, would be their argument. Yeah, but, they, but surely then the, the point is that they would be speaking to their food catering company and talking this, having the same conversation with them yeah. about the deposits. It goes all down the line, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. It? Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's a total sh- show, basically. Mm. Um, and I feel sorry for everybody. I feel sorry for the vendors. I feel sorry for the clients. I feel sorry for Scott Johnson because he thinks he's an elephant in the room. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. What do you, what do you say to him? I mean, Scott's now talking about perhaps we should be having. Um, I don't want to call it a Zoom. Perhaps we should be having uh, digital meetings where we're talking uh, where, where the the webinar is more about survival. Now. Yeah, warm jackets on. Here we go. Uh, yeah, I mean his, the original question, of course, before we went off on tangent, was you know the webinars that we're seeing are how to market for the next twelve months, yes. and then this is what we need to do to yeah. survive. Yeah. Now, I suppose part of the problem with that is a lot of the people that have been doing these webinars and stuff. Many of them have been free, and uh, you, you know for random reasons and stuff but the the ones that i found that i watched were ones you know the things that i've been watching have, have been more about editing and and physical stuff rather than um you know this is how this is how great my business is type of thing which there's a lot of that out there what really um, now yeah well there was you know we'll I'll come back to that in a moment actually um, make a note and i suppose that you know this is what we need to survive in in inverted quotes is what scott's answering and does anybody know that's the problem you know I, i've made a very conscious decision to uh to do you know i'm not shooting any weddings mm. um my presets have done well for me um that's helped uh, you know i've got my online mentoring and stuff like that that's helping mm. but it's nowhere near enough of course but th- this is the thing, you know, b- good businesses will survive, bad businesses won't. Mm. Um, and I would, one thing is for sure, if you just sit at home feeling sorry for yourself, you will not survive. Yeah. That's for sure. Uh, you know, you've got to you've got to do what you need to do. Um, now, the fly in that ointment, of course, is that there is a whole load, a whole load of businesses waiting for it to just, uh, you know, to come and snap at the heels of the full-time professionals. And I'm not... I'm not being negative about people who are part-time wedding photographers at all because, you know, we were all, we all started there. We were all that, and, yeah. you know, it's not a problem whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. However, I did a, an interview with a professional photographer magazine or pro- professional photo magazine, photo, whatever they call it these yeah. days. Uh, and, you know, and the point I was making was that the people that have a day job and are probably sat at home being furloughed and not really worrying about weddings, they are probably the ones that will survive, and they are the ones that will probably pick up the bones. Um, and perhaps it will set the industry back 
10 years in terms of pricing because those people will, uh, you know, you've got a nice day job. You, you know, you're just sat there waiting for everything to get back on kilt, which this hopefully all, it will yeah, next year. But this has always been the argument. It happened in the last recession of 2008, didn't it? And prices went down. Yeah, and they did go down, but they went up just as quickly again perhaps because i think people come on board they think ah this is great here we go and then they think oh i wasn't expecting to have every saturday actually at somebody's wedding no 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 What's no, going no. On now? no no absolutely i want to be back with my family but this is different this is not a case of people who have been made redundant who are then going into wedding photography these mm. people are already in the industry they're already in the industry they're teachers they're doctors they're mechanics whatever and so they're getting their nice day job salary mm -hmm. And they're not stressing too much about the wedding business because they don't need to. So they're already in place. But they will they have no necessity to charge, you know, what we would consider a living a living wage. And so I, I honestly think that that might happen. So the more full time pros that drop out of the marketplace, there will be more part time people. And perhaps we'll end up being part time. There's no yeah, I'm not saying yeah. it's a bad thing. Yeah. I'm just saying that this is what I think might mm. happen. Um, so this isn't a slight on those people. This is a uh, an observation of of, um, of what I think will happen. Well, so yeah, you know, yeah. I, 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 I truly believe that. I truly believe that. We I, mean, are, I think I, pivoting is really I, as much as you hate Zoom. I hate the word pivot, but I find myself using it. Pivoting is really important. Denise Maxwell, I spoke to the other day, who's a photographer in uh, in Birmingham, in in that area, in the the West Mids, and um, she was talking about how how having a business that does everything. She's I do everything. She said, yeah. weddings, fun funerals, because she's in the Caribbean market mm -hmm. um, for for funerals, which is which is a good market to be in. I, um, I hope that gets taken the correct way. Uh, but also press work she's been doing. Um, yeah. You know, personal branding for people. That's what's that's what's keeping her business. Yeah, of course. And, and going. As, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we would all, we'll, you and I, you know, we're hardworking photographers we, and we also need to feed our kids. Mm. Uh, so we would do anything also. But it's it's all well and good saying, I'll, I do anything. Mm. It's a, it's how do you do anything? Mm. You know, can you? You can't just set up a website and say I do everything. No, you know, and then wait for the phone to ring. It doesn't no. work. Like no, that. you have to go out and market. It. Exactly, yeah. we know it doesn't work yeah. like that. So the the people that are sitting at home, which Denise has been doing, to be fair, she's very, oh absolutely, she's yeah, 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 yeah. But but for every Denise, there's there's ten. Um, there's ten non Denises. <laughs> Denise, Denise, no, 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 no. Denise, 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 was, Denise, uh, Denise. No, that was Denise, Denise. <laughs> Oh, there's ten. There's ten. Hang on, catch him again. He's gone off on one. <laughs> there's ten non Denises who are who are uh, you know are sat there thinking, well, I can only do weddings. I can't yeah. do anything else. Yeah. And, and and you know what? This is the world we live in. On, the, on it, that, what on, will be will be. On that note, I also think photographers have a responsibility. You might think this is so, uh, not so important to mention, but I I, I think it is that uh, the empathic sort of um, approach that photographers should have towards each other. Well, I think it should be one of uh, people helping each other now. Now, nobody wants to go onto a forum and read endless messages of "Ooh, we're all doomed." Um, but, but at the same time, yeah, you want to hear some positive stuff. Look, this is how I'm getting business. This is a nice way to. Uh -huh. But I, I'm hearing, I'm reading so much. Well, I'm booked for 2021 and 2022. Things have never uh. been so good, and it's all bullshit. Yeah, and I, and I think the responsibility of photographers towards each other here is one of help and not posturing. Posturing bores me. Quite right, and and you, we've talked about this before. There's a, far, a lot of people where their primary currency is ego. Yeah, and when you when your ego is your currency, then who does that help? Lying. Who does that no, help? It doesn't it help anybody. Your own ego. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was that group set up on Facebook recently, uh, the Coalition of Photographers. It was set up by uh, SWPB, MPA, okay. the, the um, suppliers, um, Graphy Studio, all of those people were involved right, in it. Right, yeah. Great initiative. And yes. the, the initiative was to get as many photographers together and bombard the Prime Minister and everybody and say, look, you know what, we do exist. But sadly, the group, whilst the... Uh, the the ethics of the group were right and the people behind it were absolutely right the people that were in the group the first set of questions the first set of posts i i came across were from you know well-established older photographers who who are now retired let's just be blunt are retired so this is not having might be having an effect on them in other ways but it's mm. not having an effect on them business in terms of weddings no and, and the one the first post i saw from a, a very well respected photographer was like well in my day of course we'd have uh, we'd have made sure that 25 percent of every income we had was in cash reserve and this just would not have been a problem yeah and i was like you know what <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will bleep that out <laughs>
<laughs> I, I, I was just, you know, and it's... In fact, for those people, we'll give you a Tommy Two-Tone. <laughs> that's what you get for, for postering. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And it's like, that's not helping anybody. No. You know what? What you should be doing now as an old retired person who was very good and very well established Help. is helping. Help. Yeah, not showing off. Suggest stuff. Yeah, exactly. Suggest positive stuff that helps people who are, you know... Yeah. You don't know their, their, their background. Do you know, I think we're likely to go off at a tangent. Wasn't there a second part of that question? Um, no, we did the second part first. Did we? Okay. Mm. All right. And breathe. We need. Uh, do, you, do you know what we could set up, Kev? We could set up a retreat for, to- for photographers. What about that? Yeah. A retreat. Go to, um, let's go to the place in Spain. Yeah. Ace. Oh, no, we couldn't. We couldn't all mix. No. <laughs> there we go. Let's just go to Peacock's. <laughs> Another business or, idea. Or, Don't dream. It's going to be a long time before we can go to the... Uh, to Peacocks yeah, <laughs> together. To the little pub at the back of the plane. But, uh, yeah. Ah, oh, the little pub at the back of the plane. That'll be our first date, Kev, you and I. Little pub at the back of the plane. Mm. Right, Zyza. It's time for Zyza. Zyza. Tell me a little bit about her, which will be a nice introduction to the piece. Well, Zyza is a documentary, and I class the proper doc, what I class as a proper documentary photographer um, from the Philippines, but has been living in um, Hong Kong for a long time. And she's of a, a family who, as many Filipinos do, are um, assistants, household assistants yeah. for yeah, yeah. other yeah. other families. So uh, she, we reviewed her book in issue one or two, I episode re- one I or re- two of the of the Fujicast. I remember it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a beautiful book. And so she, be, now bearing in mind that she became a full-time photographer in 2015, also in that year, she became, she was put onto the Magnum um, uh, Scholarship. Yep. She was nominated as, oh, she was in the list of Forbes 30 women under 30. Which I think she's going to mention in the interview. Yeah, right? and the BBC 100 women I know, I in know, the world. I know, I know, um, Very, very, I mean. The and m- modest with it. The most down-to-earth person. Yeah, absolutely. The most down-to-earth person. Beautiful person, beautiful soul, amazing photographer, proper documentary photographer. Well, here she is. Siza cruz Bikani. We've we've spoken uh, a few years ago on the podcast about your uh, amazing book, We Are Like Air. Before we, we dig into your kind of backstory and all of that kind of stuff, I want to just mention that book because I think it was it was possibly the first or the second book we had on the reviews on the Futurecast podcast. And it's definitely, it's one that sits on my shelf and, it, and it's probably, and I'm not just saying this because I'm speaking to you, it's probably one of the books that's had the most impact on me as a photographer. Now that book, can you just, I think if we talk about that book a little bit, that will give people a, uh, an insight into the background and your family and, and kind of the struggles you had, I suppose, early on in your life. So my book, we are like, air. um, it's a very personal book. It's, uh, about my family. It's about the story of my mother and migrant workers in Hong Kong. So we are a family of migrant workers. My, my father, me, me, my mom, my brother, almost everyone in the family is a migrant worker. So uh, I've been documenting issues of migration since 2014, before, um, before I became a full-time photographer. I was working as a nanny in Hong Kong for almost a decade. And then I was already shooting, or no, I, I was already photographing street photography uh, since 2009, but then I decided to shift into documentary photography when I've learned that I actually have a story to tell. But then I never really documented my family because I th- I do think that it's the hardest for, for my part because when when I'm documenting other people, there's still this huge difference because I always say this, that photography is power. You know, a camera mm-hmm. is a tool of power. So when I'm photographing other people, it kind of empower me. And I'm hoping that it will empower them as well. But then there's a divide because I'm holding the camera, which means I'm taking something away from people. But when I started photographing my family, that power was taken away from me. Because now I'm not just a photographer. I'm not just a documentary photographer. I'm also a participant in this story. So it's it's a very hard project for me to do. It's very personal. It's also it's also a good practice for uh, being vulnerable because it's the first time that I've shown the world uh, my own vulnerability, even though I have a very, you know, I have a very sexy background story. So yeah, the book is, is very cathartic. It's very vulnerable and 
it's um it's a collection of stories in Hong Kong, eight different chapters of of the complexities of migration, you know. And and when you were when you were building the I suppose the the pictures came along over a period of time. It wasn't a, a project you started initially thinking, I'm going to do a book from this. This was something that that was born of the pictures you were taking of your family, I guess. Yes, uh, I started taking photos. The photos that was in the book is from 2013 to 2018. So that's like five years. So I, I've used a lot of archival images. I've I've used a lot of, of um, you know, letters, and I think that's my favorite part, the letters on the book. Yeah. I've, uh, it, it's, it's not just a photography book. It's like a novel. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, I often say it's a photo novel because you need to start from the beginning to understand it because it's, it, every narrative, every story is, is intertwined with each other. You can't start at the middle because you're going to miss something like, oh, oh, it's harder to understand when you start at the middle. You need to start at the beginning. It's the letters. It's the personal notes and uh, the kind of doodles and the, the little parts of that book that, that anchor it all together. And, and you're dead right. It's, it's something when I pick it and I pick it up often that, you know, I always I always start at the front again. It's, it's not like a normal photo book where you would just pick up and browse and flick and think, oh, that's a nice picture. It, it really does have something uh, tangible about it, I think. How did your family uh, react to the book when it was when it was all put together and uh, your mum especially? My mum never saw the uh, process of making the book. So when I finally gave her the first copy, she was teary-eyed even my former boss mrs louis even her boss was crying they're all crying because they you know the, my mom always say oh my story is not important it's just a typical story but when she saw how i put it together she was like oh my god i i, I have a story my story i am important and i'm like yes you are <laughs> you know so mm-hmm. she was teary-eyed the first time that she was crying the first time she read the book. And that's quite a humble statement from your mum to just say it's just a regular story. And and perhaps, you know, without sounding out of line, perhaps it is in some parts of the world. But for other parts of the world, it's, uh, you know, it's important for people to see these kind of stories. And, uh, you know, the, the beginnings of them, the middle and the end of them, uh, it's, it's a really important thing, I think. Before the book, um, you you were a, when did you become a professional photographer? The first time I went to New York, that's 2015. That's the uh, first time that I became a full-time photographer. That's when I left my uh, my job as a uh, domestic worker in Hong Kong. Uh, was it photography that took you to New York, or did you did you kind of end up in New York for some other reason first? It was photography. I, I won a um, scholarship through Magnum Foundation. I was one of their fellows. So it was really a very scary time for me because I, before I went to New York, I was thinking... Um, oh my God, what's going to happen to my job? Uh, I won't be able to earn money. I won't be able to help my family. So there's a lot of fear. So 2015 seems like quite a year for you. That was the year that you got the Magnum Scholarship and also the, um, I mentioned it earlier, the BBC 100 Women of the World nomination in in that, that list. Now that that's quite an amazing thing. How did you feel? When, when they first told me that I'm going to be part of the 100 uh, Women of the World for BBC, I was like, why? <laughs> I asked them, like, why? And then they were like, oh, well, we, we think that you're very inspiring. And I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> so it was it was something that, that I learned when people started saying that, that my story is inspiring. All I thought before was, I'm like my mother, you know? I think we got it from being migrants. It's, it's a residue of of being my being a migrant worker when you're not supposed to have opinions you have a voice but you're not being listened to so when people finally started telling me that oh you're very inspiring at first i don't really believe it so that's why my first reaction when they when they started giving me awards i was like why seriously why (laughs) and they thought i was joking well i think it's it's very well deserved and and i think around about the same time was it the Forbes 30 under 30 recipient as well. Was that, that around about the same time? 
I think it's 2016 or something, but okay. yeah, it's almost the same time. Now, you've moved to New York in 2015. You, you, you find yourself on the Magnum Scholarship, the Magnum Foundation Scholarship. How, how did that go? What, what, what's the process with that? Is that kind of like a, a two-year thing and you get given assignments? How does, how does that work out? It was very intense. So my teacher was uh, Susan Maisalas and Fred Richin, our teacher during that time. So it's a six weeks intensive course, basically a year of, of lectures packed into six weeks. Like we start at eight and by the time we go out, it's already like nighttime. We need to produce a project in New York. So while we're studying, we're also photographing a documentary project in a place that, that it's the, my first time to be there. So it was very intense. I think I lost a lot of weight during that time. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think that they help us a lot in a, in, a way, in a way that we were able to tell stories, uh, put together narratives. It was really intense. But once you're part of it, you're always going to be part of it. So they have different programs after it. Like we meet and then they can give us like grants through our projects. It's a good community to have. And I suppose the, the lessons you learned in, in in that scholarship, you've you've managed to, to kind of take forward in, in the work now that you do. And uh, after after kind of the family work of We're Like Air, the you then you then ended up shooting a lot of the protests in Hong Kong. Um, how, how did how did you find that? I started documenting the progress in 2014, actually, the first time that it happened. Mm -hmm. And um, when it happened again, I was in New York and I was having like a big FOMO because I'm like, I should be there. You know, I need to be there because it's such a historic moment. And then so when I went back, I always feel like I'm not part of Hong Kong, even though I've been in Hong Kong for a long time. But my relationship with the city have changed since 2014 to when I was covering the protest to, and then when I covered it again in 2019. I realized that that there are a lot of things that I have not covered in 2014 because I was just being an observer. But in 2019, when I started speaking with the... Um, protesters i started speaking with the police i started you know just just having a conversation with these people i i understand better what was happening but i do think that the violence during 2019 is so different from 2014 i i felt the change there's there's this urgent change in the way people are dealing with each other it's actually very sad because because hong kong is my my home you know it's a second home well it's, i always call it my home so just to be in the middle of it and just to to experience the violence, just to experience, it's like a roller coaster of emotion. So mm -hmm. there were violence and, and to be in the middle of it is one of the things that that I was thinking that if something happened to me, is it worth dying for, you know? Yeah, well, that, that that's that's the point I was going to make, I suppose. It, it, you're almost a conflict photographer in that case, I guess. And, you know, it's conflict between the, the authorities and the people. Um, did, did you find yourself kind of, were you right in the middle in terms of the, uh, your, your viewpoint rather than physical geographically? You know, were you shooting the protesters, the police, everything in between? Was it a particular angle that you were, you were looking at when you were photographing the ones in 2019? In 2019, I decided to point my uh, camera with the bystanders, the people who, who are watching the protests unfold, because they became documentarians as well. So you see them, everyone, you know, like there's conflict between two sides, and you see them on the side, watching with their phones, documenting, and I'm, and, and I realized that, oh, this is a good story because. When you see it on the newspaper, the focus is between the, the protesters and the police, but these people are just being on the side, but they're actually playing a good, uh, very big part, which is documenting what's happening. They're the ones who's like continuing holding on to Hong Kong. So it was, it, it was something different for me. Uh, on 2019 but of course i documented everything was this commissioned work or was this something you just felt you had to do it's something that i feel like that i need to do uh the commission works the assignments are you know it's it's something different if it's assignment you have a 
purpose in shooting it, you know? Like, you have a purpose in photographing it. But when it comes to, to something that I need to do, it's something that I wanted to do and I know that I need to show. So I was able to put together a collection of those work and it's it's been exhibited in New York, in Berlin, in a group show. And I think it's going to go back to America soon. From the, the, the kind of theoretical side of shooting, I suppose, photographing something like a, a protest or, or, or even your family work or, or the, the, the kind of medical stuff that you do now, what are you looking for when you're trying to tell a story in pictures? How does that... How does that manifest itself in your mind? I, I do a lot of research for uh, my documentary works. I need to do a lot of research, but I try to make sure that I'm still very open. I have an idea what the story is about or what I needed to photograph, but then I need to be open at the point that I can adapt to what's happening in front of me. So you're you're in the Philippines now, and yeah. your work is slightly different, I suppose, um, in that your 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 angle is now more towards the the medical profession, I believe. Yeah, um, when they announced that no one can leave the country, I was actually, you know, I have done anxiety because for our work, you know, we, we always travel, no. So yeah. it's part of our life. And then suddenly they, they put a full stop on it. It's like, okay, you can't clean. You need to stay where you are. So I, I have this serious anxiety. And then I realized that what am I doing? Why am I allowing the anxiety to creep on me? What, what, I need to go out. And because I do know that this, this year is going to be part of our history. And I need to, to tell stories. So I shifted from... from you know, from doing something too personal to protest. And now I'm doing a lot of reporting about health, which is kind of like a surprise in my part as well, because I did take nursing for two years before I left for Hong Kong. So so I have a little bit of like connection to the medical um, professionals and, and they know who I am. I know who they are. And, and so I started reporting about nurses and doctors i started reporting for cnn uh this story of of medical professionals who are being sent on the front line without proper protections and then after that i reported something for national geographic about a doctor who's saving a whole town protecting the whole town our town and now i'm doing there's another story coming out for about home birth the process of telling stories helped me get away from that depression you know? Yeah. In in terms of uh, physically photographing in somewhere like the Philippines compared to Hong Kong, uh, is it is, is there any difference? You know, in terms of uh, you know uh, acceptability or accessibility to the health workers, the uh, you know, would you be able to do the similar thing in Hong Kong? Do you think? I I was able to do similar things because when it comes to access, I think language is is a very important you know aspect of it and i think the only difference is telling the stories of our time where i grew up where i basically know everyone it's a little bit like a very tricky process because you know when you know these people and you know that you might i might be too critical of what's happening they can just you know they can just hate me and it i will i will suffer from it you know like this is my hometown so I, they can hate me for being too critical and and I realized that I just need to stick with my journalistic ethics. Like this is what's happening. This is this is our reality. So whether you like it or not, this is how the story will go. What what's kind of next on the horizon for you, Ziza? What happens? Let's let's just wave a magic wand and COVID nineteen disappears, and uh, you know the world gets back on on tilt. What happens next? What, when you when you pick up your passport, where are you going? I need to go back to New York because I'm gonna go back to school. I was able to, I was accepted at NYU Art and Politics program, which is a big deal for my for me and my family. It's a graduate mm -hmm. program, and I do not have an undergrad. So being able to like skip the undergrad part and go directly to to studying graduate school, getting a master's in art politics, it's such a big deal for me. And for me, it's like a dream come true, you know. Okay, we, we've talked about a few kind of pretty heavy stuff. So I'm going to ask you three very very trivial quick fire questions about cameras because yeah. we, we just have to do that. Um, so number one, what is your favorite camera right now? 
my favorite camera is the Fujifilm GFX 50R. It's okay. a, it's their medium format. Yeah. Yeah. So you're using a 50. You're using that for most of your work now. Yeah, because it's the only camera that I was able to bring. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, and and what's your what's your favorite lens on there? Right now, I'm using the 45 mm because again, that's my only lens. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any yeah. choice, but uh, it's my main lens for now. I think it's perfect for. You know, because right now we need to leave six feet, uh, six feet apart. So I, I do think that the, the length is perfect. I, I'm still able to get intimate images, yeah. but then I'm far away enough to be safe. Um, okay, who is your? No, this doesn't have to be photographic. But uh, who is? Who do you think is your biggest influence? I know that's a very wide question, um, but I always like to ask people that. Who's your biggest influence in life generally? I do think that it, it's Mrs. Louis my former employer in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was starting, when I got some media attention, people were, some mean people were not nice. And they were like, oh, she, she doesn't look like a helper. She doesn't speak like a helper. She's a fake. And, and they don't realize that, that I was educated by my former employer, how to act, how to speak, how to, to be a good person. So she's one of my biggest influence. She she taught me how to be respectful. She taught me that, you know, my favorite thing that she taught me was do, do not look up on people. Do not look down either. We are all born equal, but are living in different circumstances. You know, no matter who you are or what you do for a living, you're a person. You need to remember that. So she taught me that my job before... It's not my personality. That's not who I am. It's just a job. So, so I do owe her a lot when it comes to navigating the world and how to, you know, she really taught me how to be a better person. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and, and of course, she features a lot in the book. Um, that's, that's a really nice thing to remember. Do not look up to people, but do not look down to them. I think that's, that's really powerful. Um, I shall remember that for sure. There's going to be a lot of people listening to this uh, this this interview, and they will be inspired. And and any uh, this seems again a quite a difficult question to answer, I would imagine. But any tips for people to, you know, to to get themselves into a story, to get themselves heard, to become a, a true documentarian like you? How does it? Uh, how what would you give a a young Ziza tips if like ten years ago? How would you get her going? I do think that if there's one thing that I can tell myself young size is listen more you know i i most of my stories came from listening from people and and it it goes back to what mrs louis have told me like you need to speak with everyone and listen to them because when you're listening that's when you realize that there are stories that you don't even know and that then you can tell those stories I do think that listening is, is a good skill to have and listening means you're just not just hearing it but actually looking the person eye to eye and listening to them and, and making them feel that you're there, you're listening and you're there for them. So it's such a great skill to have. Where can people buy your book, find your work, see you wherever they can? What's the, what's the best place for people to get hold of you? So I'm on Instagram and it's my name it's Isa Krishnakani and you can get my book from all the major bookstores in Hong Kong but it's also available via Amazon and we press website my publisher's website we press yeah Isa Krishnakani everything you said Kev I completely understand listening to her what a down to earth um, modest humble mm. Um, complete professional she is and even though her book we are like air is not this week's review because we reviewed it once already i will also of course put it in the show notes along with everything else you do come and look at the show notes don't you because what, there what is a lot of effort yeah, put I'm... into those show notes <laughs> yes. youtube videos links to books all kinds of things <laughs> kev spends a long time there doing that every monday morning please go there because you upset him when you don't <laughs> we should come back to zyza's book i don't i mean it's been quite a while why don't we do it again yeah that's a fair point i think we should yeah um, well, but we've got a book coming up, but uh, we've got to thank some people heartily first. Yes. Our new Patriot. What do you call them? Patreons? Because pa Patreon They're the patrons. Patrons. Patrons, yeah. But he spelled Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. But that's the organisation. Yeah, Patreon. But then you become a patron of Patreon. Hmm. 
Uh, okay, fair enough. That's, that's uh, if, like, if it was me running that organisation, <laughs> I'd give them a different name. I'd call them Patreons. Would you? Yeah, because he called it Patreon. Call them mates. Yeah, mates. Anyway, <laughs> we do have a handful of new uh, patrons. So thank you so much for those of you that are helping to support the podcast. We mm. are, promise you, promise you, it is all going to good causes, uh, such as hosting, website fees, um, yeah. Neil's um Hosting fees. Microphone fluffy things. <laughs> no, the hosting fees. Those, those stuff things. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so we have a handful of more. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Fujicast if you wish to help us out for the price of a cup of coffee a month or a day. Yeah. Depends. Or you could have lots of cups of coffee a day. Anyway, we have new ones. Steve Ford, Eric Joseph, Michael Hotchleitner, Mark Simmons, Ian Young, Henk Yang, Winkel de Matt. <laughs> Do you know if I joined, I'd give myself the, the name that I know Kev would struggle with most. Henk Yang Winkeldur. I'll give you that. I, I think love that yeah, name. Ding, you got that. How many A's do you think are in Winkle Durmat? 424. No, two. All right. Uh, David Mullen, Jeremy Baker, Mark Bush. Mark Bush, my mate from university. Uh, Is he really? Yeah, I went to university with Mark. He's Did also he? from Merthyr Tidville. Is he? Yeah. Oh, you better not start talking about Merthyr then. Although he lives in Scotland now. He oh, runs right. a... Um, God, he had to go a long way to get away from Merthyr. He runs a very, <laughs> very successful farm. Does up, he? Uh, selling rapeseed oil. Yeah, Does he? Up, uh, as well as other things. Well, there we are. Uh, Keith Martin. Can we go and work for Mark? Yeah, I'm going to go and see him soon. Uh, well, I'll say soon, you know, one in, day in 2025. <laughs> Zishan Khan, uh, Simon Jones, and Steve Curzon. And uh, so, thank you so much, everybody that's uh, supporting us on Patreon. You are the latest people that have uh, come into the uh, into the echelons. So, thank you so much. And I think it was Steve that I was speaking to on Facebook the other day about the new um, Fujifilm camera that was announced. All right, just yesterday, I think. Okay. The announcement. There's a few products actually, aren't there? XS1. Yeah, it's called. And what's what's the XS1 all about? Well, I don't know because I've never seen it. Uh, well, I, I I have seen it briefly for a couple of minutes a few months ago, but uh, that was just a prototype. So I don't know. I'm not. I have not. There's a whole load of YouTube videos out there that will give you a good idea. Um, but it it seems to be. It's not an XH1. It's not an XT4 or five. It's a. It's kind of in the middle. So it's got the same sensor as XT4. Doesn't quite have the same filming capabilities. Only got one SD card. It's got a huge hand grip, which would be great. It's got a fully articulating um, screen, so for vloggers, right, I think okay. it'd be ace. Yeah, yeah. And it's got a PASM dial. A what? You know what a PASM dial is? I have no idea. PASM dial. Program, aperture, shutter, manual. PASM. You know, oh, you see camera right, dials yeah. with PASM on them. I think most Sonys and Canons and stuff like okay, that have yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I get I, it. I, I, I can, I can visualise it now. Yeah. Thinking, first of all, what, is, what does yeah, that mean? PASM dial. Yeah, I think, like I say, I think Sonys, Canons, and Nikons, yeah, they all yeah, have yeah. those. Um, anyway, I prefer proper dials anyway. But uh, you know, so <laughs> hopefully that won't be uh, that won't be the way that Fujifilm go all the way forward with the PASM yeah. dial. I'm Stand sure by for the PASMs. Be. But I think it's going to be great for mm. you know, especially vloggers. Uh, it's, I think it's coming in at around about nine hundred ninety nine US dollars as well. So if you want did the xt4 sensor that's going to save you a few bucks mm. and of course also we have the xt3 firmware coming up in a couple of weeks 28th of october i think that's going to drop so the xt3 firmware update will give you xt4 focus capabilities um which is better the, the xt4 is much better Does that than mean the swifter XT3. brisker quicker brisker af yeah. um right. especially face detection yeah Face detection is... How's face detection going to work with all our masks? Yeah, face mask eh? detection. Mask detection. We shall consider. Um, yeah, I don't know. A pass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the most exciting thing for me... So they announced, They also announced the 1024 Mark II yesterday, mm. the F4 Mark II. No, I'm a big 1024 user. I love it. Yeah. Now, a lot of people said, well, it's exactly the same, though. It's still F4, um, which the original one was. But yeah, so the difference, and, and I know that this was a, a is conversation... Wide, yeah, but is it wide open always at F4? Yeah, it's, so it's, it's the, the original. The 1024 does no. 4 to 5, 6, doesn't it? No, no, it's fixed. Have I got that wrong? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> all those years I've been using it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Um, but the difference for this one, I think, is that oh, it's Neil. it's quicker to focus yes. and also it's weather sealed. Ah, um, yeah. No, the original 1024 was not. Was was it? not no. And it's a prime landscape lens. Yes, of course. So a lot of people, of course, were like, why was it never uh, weather sealed? But the fact, the brutal fact was that lens came out well before any mm. of the weather sealed Fujifilm mm. cameras. Mm. So there you go, Fujifilm have done that. And then the most exciting thing for me, and I nearly weed myself, is the 18mm <laughs> f1.4 that has been put on yeah. the roadmap. 
Uh, I can't wait for that, as long as it's not enormous, which I'm sure it won't be. Um, no. It will not be a pancake lens. Even the like 50 the, F1 wasn't that enormous, no, really, No, no, absolutely. It? But the 18 F1.4, I would imagine it'll be somewhere in the lines of the the F2 lenses in terms of build and optical quality and stuff. Um, I can't wait for that. 18 mil F1.4. Uh, so the current one, obviously, is a pancake lens F2. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have an aperture ring or anything. Yeah. So um, I like it. Oh, it does have an aperture ring. I do ring. like it. 27 mil doesn't. Fabulous lens. I think it's uh, great. I love it. I've lost about three of them. Have you? Yeah, because they you didn't give one to me. No, no, no. I've it's got not in my cupboard. I've got my existing one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but they're so small, I just keep putting them down and they do just you? disappear. <laughs> what? Yeah, but yeah. I do love that lens. Yeah. So, yeah, a load of good stuff came from Fuji this week. Fuji Film, sorry. I found a lens hood, funnily enough, in the, in the bin the other day. Did you? Yeah, a lens hood. Yeah. I take. I can't remember what. I'd, I'd taken off the 56, I think. Just put it on the side. It was in the bin. Yeah, well. So what's my lens hood doing in the bin? Oh, I thought it was just a bit of plastic rubbish, Dad. Yeah. What? Well, that's I'll start right. chucking your stuff away. That's where lens hood should go. <laughs> Pointless <laughs> things. I know you don't like. No, they're not pointless. Yes, things. they are. Unless you're doing things that need lens hoods, <laughs> which we don't. Like photography, you mean? <laughs> uh, right. Book. Yes, book. What have we got this week? All right. So this week, let's just, just get it because it's enormous. Um, <laughs> so this week we've got a book called In the Limelight: yes. The Visual Ecstasy of New York City. Is Nightlight. this the one in London or in the nineteen nineties? <laughs> right. um, and it's by Gabriel Sanchez. Now I have to be totally honest for um, transparency reasons and legalities and all that kind of stuff. This was sent to us mm. for review, so this wasn't something that I stumbled across, and it's not off my book of mm. my bookshelf of love. Um, will, this, it go, will it go on the bookshelf of love? This is uh, yeah, no, there's no, a lot of love in it. I've I really got to be like honest. It. I really <laughs> like. I looked at it. It's a bit cheeky. So it's a brand new book, only published last week. Um, RRP in the UK is £35, Canadian $60, US $45. And essentially it was um, the photographs of New York City clubs in the night like in the in the uh, 90s. And there's a lot of celebrities popping up in this book. Um, so people like Joan Rivers, Donald Trump. Joan Rivers goes to night. Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump goes to nightclubs. Yeah, loads of them. What, with Joan Rivers? So I'm going to randomly turn to a page. Where was that one? I say randomly. It was one I was looking at earlier. Basically, this is on-camera flash yeah. snapshots, if you like, of people at the clubs. Now, the interesting thing about it is, uh, you know, from a technical point of view, people may think, you know, it's easy to do that. But it's not, of course, because, you know, there's still good composition, there's good moments, and the, the subjects are, are very interesting. Uh, there you go, there's John, Joan Rivers, Club USA, 1993. Uh, Want to have a look at that? There we go. Oh, Double wow. page spread. She's brought her grandfather along. She's brought... Uh, <laughs> uh, quite, <laughs> yes. Uh, there is There's quite a lot So that was of, a bit in, you have to see um, the page to yeah, understand that Yeah, there's quite one. a lot of um, things that you might expect to see in, in a nightclub. In, uh, Do you know, I think wedding, photo in wedding photographers would make very good nightclub photographers because they're so used to being on the dance floor, pre-focusing and uh, finding interesting moments and bang, you know, I, th I think, you know... Now, who was one of your favourite art musical artists in mm. the nineties? Randomly, nineties. I on, suppose you it were, this when you were on the telly and whatnot would have been, you know, bands like The Shaman and and Happy Mondays and stuff like that for me. Mm. But they they wouldn't have gone to New York clubs like this. Mine was Nina Cherry. Love <laughs> Nina Cherry. Love actually Nina yeah. Cherry. And Nina Cherry would have been hanging out in these bars. Nina definitely. Cherry's face is in front of me right now. Yeah, uh, with uh, the Buffalo Stance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, I need to. I want to. I want to. I want to sing it. Do you want to do the buffalo stance, Kev? No, we're not allowed. <laughs> Ellen von Unworth, who's a photographer, is there with Nina Cherry. Um, yeah. And the, uh, the page opposite is in El Flamenco Bar, 1995. Yeah. Um, and there's a lady with lots of money being put in places. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is Richie Rich, the Limelight Club. Richie yeah. Rich, look at that picture. Richie Rich. Look at him and the guy with him. I, I appreciate. So I, this is what I struggle with every week with these book reviews. Hello, Richie Rich. That nobody can see. Yeah. the pictures um, so what you have to do is go on Amazon or eBooks or whatever and look I at did, them I did spend some time with Stephen Perry in the nightclub in the 90s there we go that's that's pretty cool mm. yeah was it Love in an Elevator uh, <laughs> not between us no <laughs> <laughs> Michael Musto another icon oh there we go Woody Harlson yeah. Woody, Woody Harlson fist bumping a guy in the car park at Club USA 1993 now Woody Harlson Harrelson or Harlson I always pronounce Harlson. it okay Harlson isn't it um, let me have Harlson. a look at him. That's Woody Harrelson. Harlson, that's what I said. Harlson. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, All right, we're talking about the same man, just with a different dialect. <laughs> silent letters what is the point of them uh so anyway he is looking very much like he's about to punch the photographer who right. took this picture yeah. i'm sure he wasn't but he looks very struck uh, uh rabbit in the headlights type thing um yeah no. it's good i really enjoy actually even though it's a book that we got sent it's one that i can see myself picking up and, and looking back again because this is especially yeah. now yeah people will look at the, these people of course this is what 30 years ago yeah so I always think, um, and you, you you mentioned that that book the other day yeah. that you, you were talking about in the Photography Daily, is what are they doing now? Mm. Where uh, some of them may not even be alive anymore. Well, there's a definite look between clubs in the seven, uh, in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. So you're looking at you're looking at the nineties, <laughs> you're looking at the nineties, <laughs> uh, an interesting look. Yeah. Um, but but of course the clubs in the seventies and eighties. Now they had a different look again. Seventies in particular with a photographer that I spoke to, Toby Old, that was yeah. that covered that New York scene in in the seventies. And of course that was when uh, when uh, when there was the advance of real disco music, disco balls, and yeah. you know night fever and all that kind of thing was in. So the people that went had very different fashion so in much the same way that when you look at books and you and you say to me well there's no mobile phones in these ones that's the obvious one we always pick on when you look at the fashions in the 70s in the clubs and then you look at the fashion in the 90s in this one then you know there we go there's an entirely different look altogether oh it's free going wasn't it look mm. at this there's one here inside kenny Scharf's cosmic cavern at the tunnel and mm. is a fella sat in what probably is some kind of substance tube right. um <laughs> then on the page opposite club usa 1993 is a guy doing um some painting on the wall as it's mm. all very creative and arty you know and i i i love i love it i miss you see i never i was never really a clubber the, the 90s are also to blame for the uh, for the bubble phenomenon in in uh, so bubble parties bubble parties did you ever go to a bubble party kev no you'd have loved really. a bubble party didn't have them done a rugby club no no. no, I don't think the rugby club would have done bubble parties. No. I've been to a few. <laughs> what, is that what a bubble party is like that? That's a bubble party. Oh, is that yeah. you? No. <laughs> no. That certainly is not me. So this this page, uh, for, for those uh, who have no idea what Neil's on about like me, is called Inside the Shampoo Room at yeah. the Limelight, ah, 1995. Yeah. And there's a picture of a lady um, who has got some clothes on being covered in bubbles. Yeah, bubble party. It does what it says on the tin. Uh, look, there's Leonardo DiCaprio. And Dennis Hopper. He's not at a bubble party. Club USA after party. Oh, look at the eyes. Yeah. Look at the eyes. Some of the celebs don't want to be uh, in, uh, necessarily photographed, do they? No, these two clearly are fine with it. Um, but I would say Woody Halson didn't. No. No. He wasn't very happy about it. But I like it. I have to say, it's a good book. I, I do enjoy it. Um, and uh, it is called In the Limelight, Visual Ecstasy. And yeah. I think Visual Ecstasy is a very good title for it. Of New York City life, nightlife not, in the 1990s. Not, not one to be looked at in front of your kids. Photographs by Steve Eschner, E-I-C-H-N-E-R. We will link to it on the Fujicast page on our website, which you will all visit yeah. on Monday morning. I worked in the Limelight Club in London. Did you? Yeah, it was in a church. Do you, do you know when you when you go down the um, oh, the the road, Shaftesbury it? Avenue? Ah. Very near to the um, very near to the, the the big fire station that they've got mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So just along on, on the right, there's a small little entrance, very, very sort of gothic entrance. And uh, yeah, you go into, and it used to have lots of different rooms, but the uh, the main DJ console was you had, the only way you could get to it was by climbing up a wooden ladder. So you'd you'd go up your wooden ladder, then you get a piece of rope or string or something, you'd pull your record box up, mm -hmm. and so, so nobody could come up and on stage with you. No, no, nobody ever came up. Said, "Oi, mate, you got you know," because you, you were <laughs> you were completely. Have you got Nina Cherry records? Yeah, no, can't Nina, Nina Cherry. Cherry. Let's go in. <laughs> um, but uh, I did I did climb up once and drop my record box. Fortunately, mm. nobody underneath. But this record box went. Everybody, everybody under the age of twenty five who's listening to this is thinking, "What oh, is a record box?" Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, but, record box. Box. but records in Grandad, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Questions. Oh, before we do a question, a um, little message here from Mark Zilberman. You know Mark Zilberman. I know Mark. You do know Mark? Nice bloke. So, He's uh, on New I bet he did some New York City nightclub in in 1993. I'm sure Mark did. We've been having a few little um, little tete tates late at night, me and Mark, um, on direct message into into the Facebook. We've been talking about politics, and we're not allowed to talk about politics here, so so let's not do that. Mm. But he uh, said, uh, by the way, could you send some greetings to Kev? I spent six months with him. He was mentoring me. He's an excellent teacher, and apparently you're a real mensch. Mensch. What's a mensch? He says, Google it. So I'm going to Google it. You're a mensch. M E N S H S C H. Mensch. Mensch meaning. A person of integrity and honour. Oh. There we go. 
Oh, I quite like that. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. You're a mensch too. <laughs> it's a, it's oh, a no, men- that's it, a little that's a little Yeah. That's something you eat on your Sunday dinner, isn't it? Mench what, too. a mench? Mench too. Mench too, Rodney. Would you Rodney? like mench too with your mench Sunday too, dinner? Rodney. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> God, yeah. Tell him I did my first micro-wedding in Central Park. So he's just, I'm just telling you, he's done his first, oh. he's done his first micro-wedding in Central Park. So he has. Well done. Mm. Yeah, very nice guy, Mark. So, um, question, a direct message, actually, uh, from Jeff Sparks. I'm intrigued by the X-Pro range, as I used to shoot with Leica M8s and M9s. He doesn't say where he went, but uh, I'm assuming they've gone. Have either of you shot with Likers? And, uh, uh, and, and will I be amazed by the quality or disappointed? Appreciate your honest response. Mm. So, um, yeah. Well, I, I, I had a Leica. Did you? Oh, actually, you should answer this more than I did because you had a proper one. You kept one. You had one. I had one I had alone for two I, weeks. I yeah. used an M8 for about two years, maybe, yeah. two and a half years, Yeah, just under the three. And that was all your blurry pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was joking. my blur. That was my blurry period. Yeah. Joking, joking. Um, oh, I loved it. I thought it was a great camera. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it was a manual experience, very much. I didn't think the sensor was very good. Uh, and quite honestly, I yeah, think, but that I, was. I think a lot of people. A long time yeah, ago, it was wasn't a while it? back yeah. now, and it was awful. Now the M8 and M9, of course, are entirely different beasts because the M9 was a, a you know full frame. Camera. Yeah. The M8 was not. Um, I had an, that's why I had an M9 for two mm. weeks. Um, what, I, what did you feel? I loved it. I have to say, I loved the images that I'm, when I got them right, mm. I thought, wow. Is, is that a result of having to work manually? You mean? Yeah, but mm. I couldn't. There's no way I could use them at a wedding. I have mm. to say, uh, I know people do, and, and they, yeah. they're amazing. Well, Jeff Askoff did for years. Didn't Jeff he? did, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and that was film, actually. That wasn't even an M8 or M9 or anything. That was an uh, M6, I think. I remember going on a, a, a day's workshop at the Leica Academy with. Mm. Edmund Terracopian. Yeah. Now, this oh, must Edmund's, have been, Edmund's stuff is amazing. This must have been 10 years ago. Yeah. Must have been. Yeah, because it was definitely way before I was using the Fujifilm stuff. It was great. Uh, you know, they gave you a little uh, M9 and, you know, memory card, one mm-hmm. gig memory card and whatever it was, 256 megabytes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and off you went and we wandered around um, West London and and Edmund was snapping away, getting all these great pictures, all totally in focus and everything. And I, I just didn't. That was ultimately right. what the problem was. Um, I wonder yeah, if you'd have gone. I love the feel. Would of you it. have gone gone at it differently now? I feel like now I probably would be able to mm. deal with it a bit better. Yeah, for mm. sure, because I've done a lot of zone focusing in yeah, my time since yeah. then. I never had at that point, but uh, yeah, I do love the feel of them. I have to say, um, you know, they they are nice cameras, um, but not something workable for me. So, but. so say something about the X Pro then to Jeff. Will, well, I mean, will he be disappointed with any of the quality? I don't think so. I think it depends on how you shoot as well. Um, mm. You know, I have to say it's it's a very very expensive camera. The lens is very expensive. Everything about it is expensive. Not the X Pro range. Oh no, not the X Pro. No, no, no. Like we're talking Leica, about Leica. So. Oh no, right, no. Oh, sorry, so sorry, will, sorry, will sorry, he be sorry. disappointed with the X Pro range? No. In, uh, I loved my X Pro twos. I, I that was a real difficult day when I when I sold those to get my XTs. Um, yeah, I mean, I love them, but the thing is, your mileage may vary for everybody. Mm. You know, there are there are plenty of people who complain about certain elements of the X Pro cameras, and you know, people. Somebody was on the Facebook group this week complaining, or well, not complaining, but making an observation that his battery doesn't seem to last very long. Right. Um, and yet, I can easily get a thousand pictures out of mine. Really? How? Yeah. Well, I shot. I shot my friend's wedding last weekend. Mm. Fifteen people, all masked up. Um, and I shot for. Isn't it funny how you feel? you need to add that seven hours case anybody's listening yeah. seven hours <laughs> yeah. um i shot with xt3 x pro 2 um i had I, I started editing it yesterday i've got 1400 pictures oh. and i didn't change batteries once and oh. and i checked because of that comment on the facebook group i have both batteries still got two bars are they yeah how did you manage this because i use them i look i know how to use them properly so the camera is in um boost mode so yep, it starts yep. up very quickly um i switch it off between uses which is uh, very organically so you're not easy leaving to it do. running all day long well there, uh, there there's the reason straight away i rarely chimp i'm not using flash yeah i don't use zoom lenses do you keep the screen zoom blacked lenses. out in the back no not always i have mm. to say not always um i mean the x pro is blacked out because it's mm. it's it's covered yeah, up uh, x pro 3 yeah, um yeah. the xt not so much but the you know i don't use flashes don't use zooms all of those things do affect battery life anyway but the the, the point is uh, like i i think the x pro camera range is yeah. brilliant yeah. other people have some issues with it but by and large it's a great camera that if you i think that if you like like a cameras it's always difficult for me to say that. If you like a Leica camera, <laughs> you'll also like a Fuji, Fujifilm X Pro camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a fair, a fair comment. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your uh, 
uh, for your mail, Jeff, and uh, well, enjoy using. And that's it for um, for an, another week. Um, thank you to our guest, Ziza, today for um, for coming to talk about. And we must actually look at her book again. I think uh, that can we make a can we make a decision here that we do that? Yeah, I'll bring it back in. Mm-hmm. Yes, we should do that. Yeah. And also, thank you for your questions. If you'd like to send some in, then you can do so through click at fujicast.co.uk. Or, of course, you can go into the brand new fancy. Well, it's not really brand new. It's about a year old now. Facebook group and. Um, and and send a question via that. That's uh, the way we pick up an awful lot of questions. And and don't forget if you're a, if you're a patron in the Patreon scheme, then uh, you often get bumped to the front with your with your questions, and you can send them in that way as well. Music was from um, from Artlist, and uh, we will see you next week on the show. Bye bye. Bye bye. The FujiCast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.